weeks that you won't want to miss. They're going to be really special Sundays at North Star. And if this is your first time today and you're like, well, I'm going to visit here and I was planning on visiting a few other places, and if you can visit a few other places after three weeks, that would be great. But here's what's happening next Sunday. We'll have a guest preacher. His name is Dr. James Noble. Um, I was at the Southern Baptist Convention uh, this past summer in Indianapolis at the pastor's conference. He preached, preached an amazingly powerful message and didn't know him. And so I was hoping to connect with him. And afterwards, ran into him in the hallway and Carol and I were visiting with him and I said, you had a great message. Thank you so much for preaching it. And we had our name tags. And I said, I guess we are kin somehow. And he's an African-American. I'm not. And so we had a good laugh over that. We were visiting. And I said, so where are you from? He says, I'm from Little Rock. And I went, what? I'm from Little Rock. And so we just started talking. He's a year older than I am. Graduated from Little Rock Central High School. We knew so many of the same people, but we never ran into each other when we lived there in Little Rock together. But I reached out to him and asked if he would come and preach for us uh, next Sunday. He'll be here. He is a professor at Anderson University in Anderson, South Carolina. He's also a pastor of a local church there. It'll be a treat, be special. He's going to keep preaching in 1 Corinthians for us. and He'll have a beautiful passage in 1 Corinthians to teach us next week. Then on the third, Matt's already talked about it, we'll have a really special afternoon where we have our special member meeting, and then again we'll eat with college students on the third. But on the 10th will be another special Sunday for us for Baptism Sunday as we just celebrate obedience and faith, and then that evening will be our yawn, young adult worship night. I was really pushing that we start like at 12 a.m. for that, Uh, but they didn't want to. So uh, anyway, but that's going to be awesome. Hope you guys will plan on that. Some special Sundays coming up. Let's dive into 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If this is your first Sunday with us, welcome. But we have been studying Corinthians for over a year now. And if you kind of peek ahead next uh, two weeks from now, we'll start chapter 16. So we'll be finished before the end of the year. Holy moly, that's great. Uh, But it's been a fantastic book for us to study. So let's begin in verse 20. But as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as in Adam we all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, and then afterward, at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end. When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, when he abolishes all rule and authority and power, for he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be abolished is death. For God has put everything under his feet. Now when it says everything is put under him, it's obvious that he who puts everything under him is the exception. When everything is subject to Christ, then the Son himself will also be subject to the one who subjected everything to him so that God may be all in all. Verse 29, otherwise, what will they do who are being baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, then why are people baptized for them? And why are we in danger every hour? I face death every day, as surely as I may boast about you, brothers and sisters, in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus as a mere man, what good did that do for me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Come to your senses and stop sinning. For some people are ignorant about God, and I say this to your shame. So there's going to be a lot of scripture today just to amplify what Paul is trying to communicate. 
But as we've been studying and taking our time going through chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, all of chapter 15, all 58 verses, it's extensive, are addressing the beauty of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because he begins in chapter 15 saying, there are some among you who don't believe that Christ has been raised from the dead. And so then, as we looked at last week, what he did was he gave seven if statements. And basically saying, if Christ isn't raised from the dead, here are the implications of that. But Paul did that intending us to flip the script. And he intended us to eventually conclude, well, it's a fallacy to think that Christ hasn't been raised from the dead. Therefore, we should say, since Christ has been raised from the dead. Where does that put us? In fact, if you glance down at verse 20, he says, but as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead. So he's beginning to reverse his logic from the verses prior to that. Last week we looked at this slide, but this week I've retitled it, and it's called The Results of Resurrection Reality. Last week it was called The Results of Resurrection Denial. So I've crossed out what we looked at last week and I've put the results of the reality here. So we see our proclamation, the Greek word for this, kerygma, it's not in vain, but it's valid. And the result is that we are true witnesses about God. And the second reality is that your faith is valid and it's fruitful. And the result is you are no longer in your sins. And the third reality was those who have died in Christ are not lost forever, but actually those who have died in Christ are safe. They're saved. So here's an outline of what we'll look at this morning. And again, we're going to look at a lot of supporting scriptures. And so we're not going to be like wading our way through each of these verses, so to speak, but you will see they all tie back to what we've just read. And I would encourage you to read all of chapter 15 sometime today. Because really where we are is that it's important not to lose sight of Paul's overall train of thought as he's leading the Corinthians to some conclusions, but he's also rebuking them for their lack of belief in the resurrection. So here's the outline. In verses 20 through 22, he's reversing the argument. And he's saying, Christ has been raised. Verse 23, he gives the order of resurrection. You can glance down, but he says, Christ was the first fruits. He was the first to be raised from the dead. And that has massive implications because the rest of us, those who belong to Christ by faith, who've repented of our sin and trusted in Christ, will then be raised with him when he returns. Verse 24 through 28, he gives the order of resurrection. Of the end. What happens in the end times? Well, what happens is, is Jesus is going to defeat every power and authority that's ever risen up in opposition to him or to his father. And then Jesus will hand the kingdom back to his father. So the son submits to the father. And so everything is conquered and submitted to Jesus. And that's verse 29 through 32. Paul goes back to some what if statements. And he says things like, if Christ hasn't been raised. Why did I fight wild beasts in Ephesus? He's not literally talking about lions and tigers and bears. He's talking about like mean people in Ephesus as he's church planting there. Paul's going to say, why have I sacrificed? Why have I endured such hardship if Christ hasn't been raised? And he's going to give some examples of personal futility there. And then in verses 33 through 34, he has some resulting commands just based on everything he said so far in chapter 15. But what we see here as Paul's talking about the end here in these verses, we see the beauty of divine submission. And that's important for us to grasp. Because he's picturing Jesus ultimately conquering every enemy, both spiritual and earthly, and then Jesus submitting the kingdom back to the Father. The beauty of divine submission is fantastic because it's the submission, first of all, of all authority 
to Jesus, and it's the submission of Jesus to the Father. But the implication that Paul's trying to communicate to us through picturing the submission of Jesus, the implication is it calls for our own submission to God. It calls for our own obedience to the Father. Jesus models obedience and submission. And you may not realize that, but it's throughout the New Testament. The submission of Jesus then sometimes comes as a surprise to Jesus. I mean, surprise to us because we'll say, well, if Jesus is fully God and fully man, who would he have to submit to? He's King of kings and Lord of lords. Who would Jesus ever need to obey? But Jesus practices obedience. And if you just read Scripture casually, you may miss some of these profound examples of this. But in Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, there's a long passage that's a Christological passage. (coughs) Excuse me. But it says this, He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient. So we're meant to reflect and to understand if Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to the Father, shouldn't I then also humble myself and submit and be obedient to the Father. But Jesus' submission to his Father is throughout the New Testament, especially in the Gospels. Let me share with you some verses. In John chapter 4, verse 34, Jesus said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Jesus was intent on doing not his will, but the will of his Father. John 5, 19, Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, the Son is not able to do anything on his own, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son likewise does these things. John 5, 30, I can do nothing on my own. I judge only as I hear. And my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John 6, 38. I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John 14, 28. He recognizes the authority of the Father when he says the Father is greater than I. John 15, 10. I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. Mark chapter 14, verse 36, in the Garden of Gethsemane, just hours before Jesus goes to the cross, it says, Jesus said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. So these are all examples of Jesus' submission and his obedience to his Father such that we get to this beautiful passage in Hebrews chapter 5, beginning in verse 7. And it says this, During his earthly life, (coughs) he offered prayers and appeals with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was the son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. Jesus learned obedience from what he suffered. The implications for that are tremendous for us. Because just as Jesus learned and practices, practiced obedience, therefore so should we. So one writer said this, Jesus learned obedience not in the sense that he was prone to disobedience and had to bring rebelliousness under control, but in the sense that he fully entered into human experience. As a child, he obeyed his parents. As an adult, he obeyed the law and fulfilled all righteousness. All his life, Jesus completely fulfilled his Father's will. He knew what obedience was 
prior to his incarnation, of course, but he learned obedience on earth by experiencing it, by practicing it. In every situation, no matter how difficult, the son was obedient to the father. The sovereign Lord, Isaiah says in chapter 50, verse 5, the sovereign Lord has opened my ears and I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. I offered my back to those who beat me. So as Paul is talking about, everything will be submitted to the Father and then everything is submitted to Jesus so that God is all in all. Randy, you are a hero. Thank you for that. Let's give Randy a hand because that's fantastic. Now if you're like, where's mine? Sorry. So we've talked about the beautiful submission of Jesus, but now let's talk about the authority of Jesus because that's really clear here that Jesus vanquishes all power, all dominion, both spiritual and earthly. It says that God has put everything under his feet. So Paul's actually quoting from Psalm 8 and Psalm 110 when he says that God has put everything under his feet. So the reality of Jesus reigning as a king is indicative of a hope fulfilled. Because Jesus reigns as the type of king that we all long for, that we all want. There's this legend that people are still trying to prove is real because they want it to be real so much. But it's the legend of a king named Arthur. In this Arthurian legend, so many people have written about it, but it's this ideal king that practices good rule and blesses his people. Well, ultimately, that's who Jesus is. He's a king that's a perfect king that rules on behalf of and for his people, who loves his people, and all that he does is for his people. And so it's not just talking about the longing of the heart for an earthly dominion. It's also referring to Jesus' eternal rule of heavenly dominion. That Jesus will establish his reign fully and finally and we will love his kingdom. And his kingdom is here, but it's not yet here. Like Jesus has conquered sin and death. But when he returns, sin and death and sorrow and pain and all those things will be fully ended. So it's this already not yet type of dominion that Christ has. But we have a hint of Jesus' authority before he told us to go and make disciples of all nations. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, this is what Jesus based his sending out of us on. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus has all authority. So what Jesus did with his authority when he was raised from the dead is monumental. Jesus used his authority, his power, and his dominion to vanquish evil, sin, and death. That brought glory to his Father. He's paving the way for the Father's ultimate glory. When Jesus did that, he also provided a way for us to experience forgiveness and salvation. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Paul says, he made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, which echoes Romans 5, 19. For just as through one man's disobedient, Adam, which Paul refers to here in 1 Corinthians 15, many were made sinners. So also through one man's obedience, Jesus, the many will be made righteous. So when Paul refers in 1 Corinthians 15, which we've just read, that in Christ all will be made alive, it's important for us to understand that by trusting in Christ and believing in His resurrection, placing our faith in Him, His grace makes us alive, not dead. 
It makes us risen with Him. In Ephesians chapter four, verse, or chapter two, verse four, it says this: God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love that He had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in our trespasses. You are saved by grace. So, as we read these things, there's this powerful expression in verse 24. In chapter 15, it says, Each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits will be raised. Afterward, at his second coming, in other words, those who belong to Christ. But in verse 4, there's these four words... Then comes the end. Then comes the end. As I was studying and preparing for this passage this week, out of everything that's here, and there's so much richness and depth that's here, these four words haunted me all week long. Then comes the end. Because as a pastor, I get to stand up in front of people week after week, after week, and preach and teach God's Word. But there is nothing more important that I could do than to prepare you in this church for the end. Because the end is coming. It is a divine calling upon every minister's life to prepare people for that moment. Because that moment is coming just as surely as anything. And as much as I'd like to take time and like explain the richness in theology from this word first fruits, Christ is the first fruits from the dead. It's just fascinating when you start diving into it. And as much as I want to take some time and say, what in the world are they talking about being baptized for the dead? And by the way, we won't be doing that on November 10th on Baptism Sunday, okay? As much as I'd like to dive into some of these other tidbits that are here that are all profound and of their own right, and this past week I could not get away from these four words. Then comes the end. You see, since Christ has been raised, it means something for all of humanity. We're not allowed to say, Oh, that's nice, Jesus was raised from the dead. How cool. We're not allowed just to add the resurrection of Jesus as like, oh yeah, I I believe that. That's part of my belief system. I'll affirm that. No, the, the resurrection of Jesus, and again, Paul spends an entire chapter just trying to help the Corinthians get the significance and the vitality of it for our modern day daily experience of living if we believe that Christ has been raised from the dead we are no longer in our sins if we believe that Christ is raised from the dead it means he will come back for us if we believe that Christ has been raised from the dead it should impact how we live here and now Now here's the profound thing. When we say Christ was raised from the dead, it means this. It means he was dead. Now I think y'all are probably going, well, we knew that, but let me repeat it. If we believe that Christ was raised from the dead, it means he was dead. But the question is, Why was he dead? Did he do something that deserved capital punishment? Did was he such a horrible, awful threat to society that he must be killed? Was it through his own doing and misjudgments that he got dead? So here's the thing Christ was dead because of me. Christ was dead because of you. Christ was crucified 
for our sins. And until we grasp that, that we, I, am responsible for the need of Christ's crucifixion. Until we grasp that, we will just continue to treat the resurrection of Jesus cavalierly and casually. We'll celebrate Easter as a time to get with friends and to dress up and like to remind ourselves that the tomb is empty. But if the resurrection doesn't change how you live the rest of this day, and if it doesn't change your priorities, if it doesn't reform your thinking, if it doesn't give you joy and confidence and hopefulness and rest because you've been forgiven, you're acting just like the Corinthians. Which Paul says, some, of you, some among you don't believe there's a resurrection of the dead. If there's not, there's bad things. And we of all pity we of all people are the most to be pitied. So his resurrection means that we have two choices because of two realities. Here are our choices. You can be saved from your sin or you can remain in it. You can be saved from your sin or you can remain in it. His resurrection doesn't offer universal forgiveness without conscious repentance. Jesus' resurrection does not offer universal forgiveness without conscience forgiveness. That was Jesus' message from the moment he first began preaching. In the first chapter of Mark, the very first thing that we have recorded about Jesus' message, his first sermon was, repent and believe the good news. Repent. And believe the good news. Repentance is non-negotiable in order to walk with Christ. Once you understand that and grasp it, you can't unsee it in the scriptures. In Romans chapter 2 verse 4, it says, Do you despise the riches of his kindness, restraint, and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. In 2 Corinthians 7.10, Paul says, Godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, but worldly grief produces death. And in 2 Peter 3, verse 8, Dear friends, don't overlook this one fact. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord does not delay His promise as some understand delay, but He's patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to what? Repentance. That's why those four words are so significant. Then... The end comes. What we must not think is what Paul says the Corinthians were thinking of like, oh well, it is what it is. We can't avoid it. So let's just make the most of things and let's eat and drink and live it up. Now how, how we live in full, joyful, peaceful confidence of Christ's resurrection should be reflected in our daily living and decision making. So Paul stated clearly we have two choices to be saved from our sin or remain in our sin and that reflects two realities. And he says here in chapter 15 those two realities are this. You're either in Adam which means you've not repented of your sins which means you're still in your sin which leads to eternal death. Or the second reality is you're in Christ, 
which means that you have repented of your sins and that you are experiencing forgiveness and that leads to eternal life. Now, I've tried to represent this graphically. I'm an amazing artist. Yeah, don't be impressed. Uh, Please don't take pictures. These are all copyrighted. But let me try to just walk you through what Paul's trying to communicate here in chapter 15 about being in Adam or in Christ. So Adam looks just like pictures I've seen of him. Adam is characterized by sin. Adam sinned. And because Adam sinned, sin entered the human race, and so therefore we all sin. Scripture says, therefore, we are all sinners. We're all in need of repentance. Jesus, on the other hand, and I apologize for Jesus looking so much like Adam, but Jesus has no sin. He never sinned. He lived a perfect life. 2 Corinthians says, He who knew no sin was made to be sin, so that through him we might become the righteousness of God. But here's the thing. Guess what happened to both Adam and Jesus? Death. They both died. But what didn't happen to Adam, Jesus did for himself. Jesus was raised from the dead. He came to life. So on the next slide, here's what happens. Is anybody who has ever lived has had their sin transferred from the human race to Jesus at the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, he he sucked all of human sin and he took it upon himself. And when he breathed his last breath and he went into the tomb, our sin went into the tomb with him. So on the next slide it shows, so what do we do with that? Here's Jesus and here's the rest of humanity, the world. Well, Scripture tells us that God loved the world so much that he sent his son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So anyone that chooses to believe in Christ and repents from their sin, confessing, I am a sinner, I'm in need of a Savior, they may have life. But there's two decisions, as we talked about. So here are the two decisions. Is that on the left side, if you choose not to believe in Jesus... If you choose not to repent, you are still in Adam. You are still have death as your future. And you are still in your sins. But if you choose to repent and believe, then you are in Christ. And you have life and you are fully forgiven. That's his elementary and as simple as I can possibly make it with my masterful artwork. And here's the whole mosaic so you can see it. So Paul's trying to help us understand that when Christ ultimately conquers all things, when he comes back, all of those who are in Christ will be raised with him. It's a promise. But down there in verse 29, it says, Otherwise... (coughs) Randy, I'd give you another hand, but otherwise, Paul moves back in these last verses, back into his what-if arguments that he began, that we looked at last week. What if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead? What if, and he's basically saying two things, otherwise, if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, I've been an idiot. Why would I have put up with people in Ephesus? Why, why would I have lived the way I've lived? Why have I lived a self-sacrificing life? Why have I chosen to love people? Why have I chosen to pray for my enemies? I'm an idiot if Christ hasn't been raised. And then secondly, he concludes with, we should be living it up and focused only on ourselves. We should eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Just live it up, party it up. 
But then we come to these last couple of verses where he says, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Come to your senses and stop sinning, for some people are ignorant about God. Out of all that we've already read in 1 Corinthians, this is the first time Paul issues a command. He's been laying the theological framework. He's been laying the importance of believing in the resurrection. But then he comes here to this command, do not be deceived. Because some of the Corinthians had been saying there's no such thing as a resurrection from the dead. Paul just says the solution to that is, hey, quit being deceived. Quit being fooled. I think we would all acknowledge that for someone to be deceived, there has to be a deceiver, right? Makes sense. A poser of half-truths, people who twist accuracy into inaccuracy. Even today, we know that these people who are deceivers often look good. Suddenly break out some words I've learned recently, just to show I'm keeping up with the times, all of those people on the flip-flop in the fields who are hip and dope and riz and sick influencers, that you allow into your lives and into your consciences, who are speaking supposed words of truth but sound just a little bit off or different whether they're spiritual, political, or just cultural influencers. Paul warns us to stop being deceived. There are deceivers out there that require our understanding of God's word and truth and how it applies to our lives. Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 14, Be on your guard against false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. Think about that. Jesus is saying, these people are going to look like you. These people are going to try to be impressive. And even today, we recognize those things in our image-driven, visually stimulated culture We easily are impressed if something is well done through video and cinematography such that we think professionalism must equal truthfulness. Well, back in the old days when we used to like look at books, we would say you can't judge a book by its cover. And you can apply that same truth to any type of media today. You can't judge something just by the sheep's clothing that they come to you in. Jesus said you'll recognize them by their fruit. We know that the ultimate source of deception and lies is from Satan. And then Paul says bad company corrupts good morals. It was a quotation. It was a wisdom proverb. Apparently that was well known to the Corinthians. We kind of say, beware of peer pressure. Bad company corrupts good morals. Watch who you hang out with. Watch who you allow into your lives. Watch who you keep company with. Because they can lead you down a path that you don't want to go. And end up perverting or corrupting your heart. And then he has this real simple command, stop it. Just stop. Just stop. I can't think of anyone that says this any better. Sean referred to it a few months ago, but Bob Newhart, he passed away this year. But let me show you a clip from one of his episodes on the Bob Newhart show that illustrates this importance of just stopping it. Tell me me about the problem that you wish to address. Oh, okay. Uh, Well... I have this fear of being buried alive in a box. (laughs) I just, I start thinking about being buried alive and I begin to panic. Has has anyone ever ever tried to 
to bury you alive in a box? No. No, but truly thinking about it does make my life horrible. I mean, I can't go through tunnels or be in an elevator or in a house, anything boxy. So what, what you're saying is you're, uh, you're claustrophobic. Uh, yes. Yes, that's it. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, let's go, Catherine. I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, say two words to you right now. I, I want you to listen to them very, very carefully. Then I want you to take them out of the office with you and incorporate them in, into your life. Well, shall I uh, write them down? Well, it, if it makes you comfortable, it's just two words. Most, we find most people can, uh, can remember them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You ready? Yes. Okay, here, here they are. Stop it! <laughs> I'm sorry? Stop it! Stop it? Yes, S-T-O-P, new word, I-T. So, what are you saying? <laughs> you, you know, it's funny. I, I, I say two simple words, and I cannot tell you the amount of people who say exactly the same thing you're saying. I mean, this, you know, this is not Yiddish, Catherine. This is English. Stop it. So, I should just stop it. There you go. I mean, you, you, you don't want to go through life being scared of being buried alive in a box, do you? I mean, that sounds, sounds frightening. <laughs> it is. Then stop it. I can't. I mean, it's been with me no, since no, no, childhood. No, no, no. No, we, 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 we don't go there. Just... Just stop. So I should just stop being afraid of being buried alive in a box. You got it. Good girl. I think Paul spends all this time in the chapter a little bit frustrated with the Corinthians. Because he looks at their lives and he says, Friends, Jesus was raised from the dead. Why are you living as if he hasn't been? Stop it. Start enjoying the reality of the resurrection. Start being confident and joyful as you reflect the beauty of who Jesus is to your friends and to your family. He would ask it another way to the Corinthians, are you in Adam or are you in Christ? Are you still in your sins or are you forgiven? So let me invite the worship team to come up as we kind of wrap up this morning. But here are some thoughts for us as a result of what we've studied this morning. First thought is just this, how should we then live? If Christ has been resurrected, how should we live? This is actually the title of Francis Schaeffer's famous book that he wrote back in 1976. Just asking the question, how should Christians live in a sinful culture? We live then as people who are confident that Jesus has been raised from the dead and he is coming back to take us to heaven with him, raising us as well. It means that we should be confident so much that it impacts our attitude, our future expectation, our behavior, our choices, our relationships. Second thing, we should consider deeply this morning whether you are in Adam or in Christ. As I said, even as I was preparing and dealing with this reality of then comes the end, the most important thing I could prepare you for is for the certainty of knowing that you are in Christ. And if you're here today and you are in Adam, it means that you must repent and believe for salvation. And if you're in Christ, we practice daily repentance. When we commit sin before the Father, we remind ourselves that we've been forgiven because of the cross. And we begin believing for a fruitful, hopeful, and transformed life again. Thirdly, we should watch our input. Bad company corrupts good morals. Stop being deceived. Watch what comes into your life. And lastly, stop it. 
Stop it. I don't know what that means to you today, but some of you it means stop being faithless. Stop avoiding making the decision about Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you're thinking, yeah, I've, I've never asked Jesus into my life, and I would just say, stop it. Today's the day. Today's the day of salvation. We're not promised tomorrow. And for some of you who have grown up in the church, and you really can't identify a moment where you surrendered your life to Jesus, you just kept coming to church. Can I just exhort you today to don't assume that you can ooze into heaven? Every single person has to repent of their sins and trust in Christ. Stop assuming that you're going to be in heaven if you've not repented of your sins. Let me pray for us and as we pray the band will start playing in just a moment we'll sing our last song and at the end of the song I'll be in the back along with some of our leaders and if there's some of you who are here that you need someone to pray with you or pray for you or maybe you just want some initial instructions on how to follow Jesus in faith we are here for you today.